Well, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a real honor to be here. And actually, I, I flew out of a, a pretty epic rainstorm yesterday into pretty nice weather here, so thanks for saving me from a West Coast fall. Um, really impressive numbers to hear about your industry uh, and to see the incredible growth that you guys have had over the, the last number of years. It's, uh, it's a pretty cool story. So um, today I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, craft beer culture. And since this is a brewer's conference, I think I should be clear I'm not talking about yeast culture or PDO or lacto or any of the other great bugs we're using to make fun beers now. Um, I'm talking about the human part of culture. And uh, I like to think of, uh, you know, if microbial cultures are what gives beer its incredible flavor and character, I like to think of the, uh, the human part of the culture as, as the part that, um, that's responsible for the amazing energy behind craft beer. And I'm talking about the brewers and the sales folks and the distribution people and the marketers and the bottlers and the growler fillers and keg washers. And they we're all responsible for what makes craft beer so magical on top of the actual beer. So when I was thinking about my topic for this morning, I immediately thought of the culture of my own brewery as a starting point. And I thought to the beginning, and in the beginning, I don't have a lot of clear memories. <laughs> um, but I do have a really clear memory of our first staff party, and that was, that was year three of the brewery when I first hired staff, it was 2004. And we had a sales guy named, uh, we called him Martha, as in Martha Stewart. I think it was probably mostly because he was normal and we were all just disgusting, but he was really into cooking and, and he dressed well and he's just a different person than the rest of us, but he was a great cook. And so he decided that he was gonna, he was gonna feed us that night and he made an amazing meal. And one of the dishes was a, an oil-soaked carrot dish. And uh, that was the only one that we didn't eat. And so we had a great food fight. And um, you know, none of our girlfriends were all that impressed. I remember getting a really significant dry cleaning bill the next day. Um, and the whole thing was fueled by a new beer for us at the time. It was an amnesiac double IPA. And, um, and that was what fueled it. And when I think about last year's staff party, it's really not too different. You know, We started with beer pong and Pilsner around 11, and then that went into bowling around three with IPAs. And then that inevitably progressed into uh, our, our annual tradition of, of our staff doing, you know, newbies have to do these skits or musicals or whatever the case might be to entertain us. And usually that's by the time we're into barley wine and it's pretty sloppy. And what I really can't help but reflect on is how different that is from what every other company in the world does for a Christmas party. Most people get fired for that kind of shit. <laughs> There's something really different and unique about craft beer culture. And, uh, and I think it's, it's kind of fun to start exploring it. I remember when I was first enamored with craft beer. It was the beer that sucked me in. I'm sure like most of us, it's the beer right in the beginning. It's plain and simple. It's more interesting. It's more imaginative. It's creative. It's challenging. And at the end, it's just more delicious than anything else that's available on the shelf. For me, I was instantly hooked on microbrewed beer. I can't even say it now. It's been so long since we've been at craft brewers, but back then it was microbrewed beer. But I realized there was something else going on. Craft beer, besides being clearly better than the alternatives, was special in other ways. It was, it was rogue. It was independent. It was creative. It was daring. The labels were interesting. It was cooperative, and it had its own subculture, and that really appealed to me. And to take that word culture for a second, it's a word we hear a lot about, as in culture as in a national culture, or an umbrella word to describe the arts, or dance, or music and theater. And of course, we hear a lot about corporate culture as well. And in all these cases, corporate or culture is just a proxy for describing how we interact with one another and our surroundings. It's kind of like our cultural SOPs. And for those of you that aren't in the production side, SOPs are standing op standard operating procedures. They almost always have a positive and aspir aspirational affiliation. We all want to be affiliated with and experience interesting and exciting cultures. Culture is an attribute. 
And as I started to work in breweries, I came to realize what an unusual subculture craft beer was. We shared ideas, ingredients, equipment, rides to beer festivals, hangovers. Um, we were all galvanizing against macro brews. We all had more to gain by working together, and we still do. At its heart, craft beer stands for a lot of cool things, most importantly, great beer. Unlike large breweries, you never hear craft brewers call beer the liquid, um, as if it's some sort of unremarkable liquid on its way to, or fluid on its way to a treatment plant. We all make amazing beer, and that's why we're, we're here, and that's why we get out of bed in the morning, and that's what rewards us at the end of the day. But beer is more than just marveling at our newest creations. In most breweries I've checked out, craft beer also stands for charity. At my brewery, we run a program called the Benefit Brew, where we, we take nominations from all sorts of great charities, and we have an online public uh, vote to see who, who will the winner be. And that winner will receive a unique beer, we sell it, we give them the proceeds of that sale. Um, and it's a great way to support them. They get, they get great public recognition from it, as well as a fairly, fairly good check at the end. Um, the staff love it. We're all engaged. We're all excited to see who's going to win every year and what kind of beer they're going to want us to make. Inevitably, for some reason, it's always some canine-based charity, but we're still excited to see who the winner is. Um, and a quick uh, Google search of, of Ontario uh, charity beers reveals the same spirit is live and well here. I saw that um, Sleeping Dog is doing a fundraiser for the Stahl Foundation for Childhood Cancer, and it's so awesome. And Trestle is doing a fundraiser for Parkinson's. Good for you guys, it's great. Uh, Nickelbrook and Sawdust City are doing a collab together in support of juvenile diabetes. These aren't insignificant lip service type contributions, they're significant and generous. And I know the list goes on, but like the rest of the world, I don't really get past the first page of Google. Um, but it's something important and we should all be really proud of it. And that last fundraiser is worth thinking about for a second, the collaboration beer. Can you imagine another industry where two competitors will work together, share ideas, share equipment, share ingredients, and collaborate like this? Like I don't know, Apple and Microsoft making an operating system together just for shits and giggles? It's just ridiculous. It doesn't happen in any other industry, and it's really cool and special about what we do. It demonstrates the cooperative and supportive energy of our industry. A spirit is a cornerstone of what binds us together. And when so many are feeling isolated, the inclusiveness of craft is an important statement and part of why the public views us so favorably, not only for our beer, but for who we are as an industry. Craft beer is environmentally responsible, and I think this is kind of a cool one. Whether it's as simple as making sure that spent grains go to farmers or more, more elaborate resource um, saving endeavors, every brewery I know has a commitment to brewing in a sustainable manner. Years ago, we undertook a CO2 life cycle analysis. And we were really excited about what we could do to reduce our environmental footprint. We, uh, we found out that using bottle pool glass instead of one-way bottles made a significant difference to our CO2 footprint, so we, we made that change. We built a CO2 reclamation plant so that we could capture our CO2 for, from fermentation and compress it and clean it and reuse it. Uh, we were shocked to find that our malt had a big CO2 footprint. Um, you know, to my mind, grain grows and then you make, you make beer out of it and it's a, a, a one-year loop on CO2 and should have it in net zero. But what we discovered is that the transportation and the kilning had a significant impact. So we installed a mash press to reduce our grain consumption. And that inevitably led to building a malt plant so that we could uh, work with local farmers to grow our, our malt locally. And the list goes on. But what I know is that consumers respect the work that all of us do in this area, and we hear it and we see it. And they respect it not because we do it to gain favor, but because we do it as part of our natural culture, part of our collective values that we have as an industry. Craft brewers also have a commitment to innovation. When I started, to brew, started brewing, there's maybe a dozen styles of beer being made, and they were inevitably all ales and lagers. Um, and that was innovative, because before that, there was really only one or two styles of beer in North America. The forefathers of the craft beer movement were the giants that set innovation as a corner post of our industry. And I think most of them would be mostly proud of most of the beers that we're making now. 
I think some of them would be kind of shocked too. Um, but that's a good thing. Um, and when I think about that, you know, there really haven't been too many ingredients that haven't made it into our collective brew kettles over the last number of years. I can't help but think of Wincoop Brewing's uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Oyster Stout, uh, which uh, oyster stouts are, are, are bull testicles. I figure once you put that in a kettle, it's, that's pretty much an end point. There's nothing else that matters. When you add all this up, it's a pretty cool list of attributes to be proud of, and it's no wonder that people are attracted to craft beer. Wearing our shirts and hats with pride, coming to our events, being friends with us on social media, and being our biggest champions in the bar. Craft beer culture is a significant asset to us. Culture is worth valuing. The boss, Bruce Springsteen, once said that in, in art, one plus one better equal three, otherwise it's just paint and paper. And craft beer it fulfills this. You know, certainly each one of us has experienced the magic of what our raw ingredients can become at the end of the day, especially that masterpiece that works in just some higher way. And I'm not implying that you can taste culture in beer. Certainly, you know, beer culture, you, you don't want to taste beard in your beers. Um, but, uh, but craft beer culture is an art on top of its art. It's additive, and that's part of why craft beer isn't just the liquid. It's something that our fans appreciate. It's special, it's unique, and it's part of what our product offering is to our customers. There's also a commercial reality to our culture. We operate in a more respectful manner than those in other industries. We're proud of what we make, and so we don't race to the bottom on price. We don't target individual brewers when we're out looking for new lines. We let each other know when they have a keg on tap that isn't quite right. These might seem like small things, but they're the foundations of why our industry has been, so pro has been profitable enough to support small-scale brewing, to allow us to use great ingredients, to allow us to come up with new beers, to make that passion beer that makes no economic sense, or to re invest in R&D, or be involved in the arts, music, and theater, or be engaged in charitable action. Craft beer culture is a safeguard of our collective financial security. We all start breweries under the banner of craft beer culture. And of course, what makes each, brewery each brewing company interesting is the culture that develops in that crucible that your brewery becomes. Inevitably, it's set by the founders, the idea of the founders and the first couple of employees through the door and how they approach beer as well as the business. It's what makes the start so important and exciting. When I started Phillips as a one-man show for the first couple of years, um, I got through that and I was able to start hiring some passionate beer guys. The first two guys through the door, uh, Ron Bell and Deebs Bell, the unrelated Bell brothers, brought music into the brewery through their band at the time. And music has since become an important part of our company culture. I'm not sure how many bands we have playing it through the brewery now. I remember a couple of years ago counting about 17. Um, and a bunch still practice in the warehouse. But it's, what it's done is it's led us to holding a, a large number of outdoor music events at our brewery. And we started with smaller events about 10 years ago in our parking lot. And then when we had to build a loading dock, we designed the loading dock so that it could become a stage. And so that made for bigger concerts. And then when we outgrow that loading dock, we had to build another loading dock, and we did the same thing. And so now we're able to shut down the streets around the brewery, and we hold uh, weekend-long concerts for about 4,000 people a few times throughout the summer. And it's been a become a really important part of our, our beer culture in terms of uh, how our employees uh, view us and also how the outside world views us. Likewise, Sean O'Keefe, who's our amazing graphic artist, brought art to the brewery. He, uh, he connected us through charity art shows that we used to host at the brewery, and that connected us to the community, and that brought other artists in. And so we had guys like Scott Amos, who built this cool uh, beer organ, like a musical organ made out of beer bottles. Um, we had uh, Russ Papp, who built us uh, our, our gypsy trailer, which is a 40-foot long, 32-trap uh, tap beer trailer, it looks like um, a gypsy trailer out of LA, Dr. Parnassus. Um, we have the, the Dobell brothers, uh, Chris and Stu, they're second generation Australian sign painters that 
hang out in our uh, in a sea can in our parking lot. Everything happens in our parking lot. It's warm enough year round. It just rains all the time. Um, but they hang out there sniffing fumes, drinking beer, and, and cranking out the most amazing hand-painted signs. And that, that's, that's all part of the art of, of our, our brewery, and it's part of the culture. And it was some of the first guys in the door that shared their passion for the brewery. It didn't come from me. But our culture also grew out of necessity. We are a DIY brewery. We built the first couple bottle fillers, um, our first 15 tanks, and our second brew house. And due to who we were, which was a really just a happy accident of hiring like-minded people, it was kind of a quirky and reckless culture. It was, uh, it was built on beer and forklift tag, uh, and what was at the time, terrible facial hair. I think it would be pretty normal now, but um, I don't have any anymore. Uh, it was fun. We were all engaged in the brewery. And it continued that way through a move to our second brewery, going from three to five staff, and then seven, eight, and 12. And then another move to our, our, our current home. And we always moved in the summer. And if for any of you that are growing right now, summer is a shitty time to move a brewery. Don't do it. Um, but uh, we continued to grow at a frantic rate. And as our head count ra reached around 30, I was pulled, a, pulled in a million different directions. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but I was in the middle of a culture shift. I was so used to chaos that I didn't notice that the staff weren't. And they didn't like it. And that's the nature of culture shifts, is they happen incrementally. And they happen in the middle of the night. And they get away on you before you even know they've started. In hindsight, tons of causes. Rapid growth is always stressful on a company, um, and in, especially when you don't have enough money to do it. Uh, we had, we'll call it experienced equipment, um, but it was old, old shitty equipment. Um, and that was frustrating for staff. Uh, we had uh, rapid hiring, and as a result, we didn't always choose the right staff. And even when we did, it didn't do the best job of indoctrinating them and, and, and really helping them understand who we were as a company. Um, and we didn't have a manual or a newsletter, and that was totally my fault, because I just thought they were so corporate, it seemed like such a terrible idea. Um, and now that we have one, I realize what a bad idea that was, because it's, it's a great venue for terrible puns and incriminating photos, and, and also real information once in a while, too. Um, so if you don't have those, they're, they're worthwhile getting into. Uh, they help to preserve culture. But in any case, we were still focused on beer, but the casual relationships were being strained. Nothing was as easy to get done as it used to be. We started having a higher staff turnover. People weren't sticking around for beer after work as much. And there wasn't as much uh, of a push to get the beer done at the end of the day, in terms of the, the bottling runs. It was harder to kept, keep the brewery, brewery clean, and the usual creativity and fun was missing. It was becoming work, I guess, really, is what it came down to. And that's when I realized the importance and the power of maintaining our culture. Fixing it wasn't fun, and in our case, that meant we had a couple of staff changes that needed to be made. Um, but it was a brief chapter, luckily, and because our culture is part of what allows our brewery to continue to have staff contributing to new beers, to new ideas, new events, new names, all sorts of stuff. Culture underpins our growth. But the reason for telling you this is the broader craft beer culture is much the same. We've been growing quickly for a long time, and unlike our breweries, we don't have the luxury of deciding who's coming into our industry or leaving. There's no gatekeeper. The manual doesn't explain how to be part of the community, how to operate in the marketplace. It really just tells you which government departments require checks and how big and how often. Um, and the collective pressures of our market are growing at such an exponential rate. You know, even here, we, we hear it. I, I think adding up those numbers uh, I just heard about, it sounds like there's almost 400 breweries that are going to be here in the next year or so. That's a phenomenal change over a couple of years ago. In the US, half of the top 36 breweries are showing volume decline. So when you start to see the number of breweries increasing and the competitive pressures increasing, um, these, challenge, these pressures are the kind of things that challenge our traditional ways of operating. It's easier to treat your competitor in a respectful manner when growth is robust. 
But in a challenging environment, the more likely it is someone's going to do something in the marketplace that impacts the overall industry in a negative way for immediate gains. And quite often, I mean innocently, without knowing or even understanding the effects of their actions. These competitive pressures will strip away at our culture. And it's a tough tailspin to pull out of. With our breweries, we can read out, weed out the rot that infects our culture if that happens, or we can work to fix the rough parts and work on our communication. It's a really tough thing to do in an industry. But what we can do is protect what we have. Culture is built on relationships. And as we have more and more brewers entering the industry, the more challenging it is for everyone to know and respect each other. It takes work to nurture and strengthen a culture. It's not passive, it's a conscious effort. It's far more realistic to preserve a culture than it is to regain one. Culture shapes people and people shape culture, but that requires leadership. And leadership is becoming friends with your fellow brewers. Leadership's talking about the importance of being part of the craft community and of the community at large. Leadership's celebrating your beer community and taking time to talk about how we can work together to educate our consumers. Leadership is taking the time to have a mildly awkward talk with one another when someone's doing something in the, in the marketplace that's gonna screw things up. Leadership is operating your brewery in an ethical manner. And leadership is being an active part of your craft beer association, in this case, the OCBA, and just by being part of this, this conference today. I'd like to close by challenging you to commit to strengthening and reinforcing your local beer culture. Your customers value it. It's a significant financial asset. And it makes for an industry that's fun and exciting to be part of. It's a source of pride. And it requires effort for us to maintain it. You're in a room full of your industry peers. Chances are you'll sit down to someone you don't know at some point today. I'd, I hope this is an opportunity to meet that person. If you take anything away from the conference today, please make it at least one new friend in the industry. These are the relationships that are gonna preserve our collective craft culture. Thank you.